Well, hello everyone, and today we are still with Michelangelo. He had a very, very long life, and as a result, we are still very much with him. And um, by 1516, he finds himself back in Florence, working for the Medici. And what the Medici want this time is finally to give uh, their private chapel, San Lorenzo, a facade. Uh, the uh, church itself was um, built uh, back in the, uh, at the end of the 4th century and then of course uh, had seen many, many reincarnations. Uh, the, la the latest and the best is um, by Brunelleschi back in the um, 15th century under the Medici patronage, of course. And this is where all the Medici are buried. Uh, here it is. It still does not have a facade because the project ultimately was shelved and another project began, which of course upset Michelangelo to no end. Uh, this is his projected facade and uh, what he wished to do was uh, to combine all the achievements of uh, Renaissance and to present Florence with the most beautiful facade, the Renaissance facade that had ever been designed. But as I said, the project was shelved and another began. This is uh, Brunelleschi's interior on, of San Lorenzo. And the project began in uh, 1419, but it wasn't uh, finished until about 60 years later, after Brunelleschi was dead, but by his design. And as you see, it is a beautiful Renaissance interior in Pietro Serena, which is a local limestone that, um, that also comes in gray, as you see, and that's what Brunelleschi did here. He did this beautiful trim to uh, underline the Renaissance achievement and Renaissance beauty and harmony. Brunelleschi also designed the old sacristy, as you see, in the early 1440s. He designed the old sacristy to distinguish it from the new that Michelangelo will do. And um, it, he designed it as a cube surmounted by a hemispherical dome on pendentives, a device he adopted from the Byzantine practice of bridging the corners of the square to provide a circular base for the dome, and thus the great domed spaces of Renaissance can trace their origins to Brunelleschi and before that, in fact, to the Byzantine practice. And here is the difference. This, for instance, is the easier way of doing it. If you have a square base and you want to place a dome on it, which of course would be circular, what is needed then are the so-called squinches right there in the corners so that when we literally try to place a round shape on a square base, the corners would be taken care of. However, it looks a little awkward because the transition from square to round, I mean, it's a little jarring. You can see immediately the, uh, the transition. But, however, Byzantine architects back in the 6th century came up with this ingenious device. And the ingenious device consisted of the so-called pandentives. And with pandentives, a square base very gradually and very logically became a circle. Here is uh, another demonstration. Here we have uh, the dome on squinches and here is the dome on pendentives. Uh, you see here the squinches are these corner pieces that have to be fit into the square base in order to hold the dome and the pendentives are here. The pendentives triangular section of a sphere make it possible to place a dome on a ring over a square. Squinches achieve the same goal by bridging the corners of the square to form an octagonal base, which of course very easily then translates into a circular base. But, needless to say, 
pandentus took the eye very smoothly from a square to a circle, which squinches did not do. But that's what Brunelleschi did here, and this is what pendentives look like from the inside. They're also very convenient because things can be hung there, or they could be painted, and uh, on the inside, on the interior as well, they provided a very smooth transition. Now, once the facade was shelved, the project that Michelangelo was charged with now was to create a new chapel, as opposed to the old chapel that Brunelleschi had done. And the design, technically, with Pietra Serena and, uh, uh, and the trim, was to be somewhat similar. Well, needless to say, uh, Michelangelo went his own way. He was given, as he was given with the Sistine ceiling, he was given an unusual degree of freedom. And that was really his um, one chance, uh, one of those extremely fortunate chances where he could combine architectural and sculptural programs together to make one beautiful whole. And um, it's unfinished. However, even in its unfinished condition, it's probably uh, one of the most successful such undertaking, where everything is combined in one holistic whole. Here you can see it from here. It's called the new sacristy, as opposed to the old sacristy. Michelangelo received the commission from Leo X in uh, 1520, even though they spoke about it already in 1519, and then a year later Leo will be dead, but then two years later another Medici Pope will ascend the throne of St. Peter. Um, Leo wanted to combine the tombs of his younger brother, Giuliano, Duke of Nemours, and his nephew Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, with those of the Magnifici. Lorenzo and his brother Giuliano, who had been murdered in 1478. Giuliano, the younger brother of Lorenzo. And their tombs, Lorenzo and Giuliano's tomb, were then in the old uh, sacristy. So here it is, he combines, as I said, architecture and sculpture in one uh, beautiful, uh, magnificent, logical, holistic whole. And uh, you can see it here. The two sculptural programs are the most famous, and that is the tomb of Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino. Now, he was son of Giuliano and a grandson of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And the other tomb is that of Giuliano, who was uh, the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. So there's an uncle and, and a nephew. And here you see in the fresco by Ghirlandaio the, um, the young Giuliano as a boy who is there with Poliziano, who was a very important member of the Platonic Academy. Here they are. The two dukes, um, they are dressed in, um, in Roman armor because they were, in fact, captains of um, the, the people army, and thus they are both dressed in the, uh, in the torso armor of uh, the, uh, the Roman officers. Lorenzo here, Duke of Urbino, and here is uh, Giuliano. Both dukes, in fact, wore a beard, but Michelangelo portrays them as beardless, as the Romans mostly were, because Romans usually were clean-shaven. And, um, and his uh, reaction to the questions about that was that, well, these are not the portraits, the portraits of uh, the men. These are the portraits of who they are, not of their faces. And uh, years from now, decades, centuries, nobody will remember what they looked like, but they will always look noble, upholding the uh, Roman values uh, of uh, virtue, of courage, of 
glory and that's how Michelangelo wished to portray them. So when we look at these two, uh, we are not looking at the exact likeness, physical likeness, but as the likeness of the spirit. In the tomb of Giuliano, what we have here is we have allegories of day and night. And day is this enormous figure in, in tremendous contraposto. So we go to the tomb of Giuliano and here we see the allegory of day, which is, as I said, an enormous figure in this tremendous um, contraposto, which is not finished. Because political situation uh, towards 1530s uh, was such that it was not safe for Michelangelo to be in Florence any longer, and essentially he just ran away from Florence, never returned, and left the statues unfinished, as you see it here. But uh, the magnificence of, uh, of this muscular body that is turning around as if meeting the new challenge, which is a new day, is remarkable. Uh, it is uh, quite possible, in fact likely, that um, Michelangelo in his mid-years to later years was very influenced by Hellenistic sculpture. And one of the sculptures is this Laocon, which was unearthed in the very early 16th century in Rome and was immediately recognized for what it was uh, from the writings of Pliny the Younger. And since everyone read Pliny at the time, uh, they immediately recognized the statue. And Michelangelo was among the excavators and was extremely excited. And here you see Laocoon, the priest of Troy, who warned the Trojans against bringing in the horse at which point Athena, who was on the side of the Greeks, caused for enormous snakes to sliver out of the ocean and attack both Laocoon and his sons. And this Hellenistic portrayal shows the priest and his two sons in, in essentially in death throes. And Michelangelo was so impressed by the struggle, by the writhing, by the heroic nudity of the priest that he adopted it to many of, to much of his own work. The, uh, the day, and here is the night, here. Uh, now, it's often been said that they look as if they're sliding off the sarcophagus. Well, they seem to be, but Michelangelo also pro uh, projected to carve the river gods. Uh, underneath these statues and the river gods, had they been carved, would have supported these statues and the whole thing would have probably somewhat of an elliptical composition. He also created the, um, the tympanum or the pediment on the sarcophagus, which is broken in the middle, which was very unusual for the time and which of course will be adopted later on by uh, one uh, and all. And uh, it's almost as if Giuliano belongs in between day and night and uh, his powers of virtue and his powers of character in fact conquer, conquer the, uh, the, the natural progress of the day. Uh, the, um, the figure here, uh, Michelangelo carved her from a male torso, and there are a number of sketches that, um, that we possess that show it, and then he attached the breasts. Uh, the breasts look uh, as if they belong to, to a woman uh, having had a number of children, but the face, however, is uh, quite young. But she also, had, uh, she also has under one arm this mask of the night, and uh, the owl here, which may characterize the dreams that we have, the even nightmares that we might have in the night. This particular pose will become very popular and Michelangelo himself will adopt his own pose. For instance, in this um, painting, this is a copy by um, Cornelius uh, Boss after a lost original by Michelangelo which he did after 1530. But not only Michelangelo, Rubens and other painters will also adopt this particular pose in, uh, 
in various circumstances. And um, this is the tomb of Lorenzo, where he portrays dusk and dawn. And the same thing with the sarcophagus. The sarcophagus is broken in the middle. The, um, after the death of Leo X, uh, there was a Dutch Pope for a short while, uh, and, then, uh, and then he died uh, under suspicious circumstances that, of course, immediately were rumored to be poisoning. And uh, another member of the uh, Medici family was elected Pope. He was a cousin of Leo X and the son of Giuliano, the one who was murdered. And um, he and Leo were always very good friends. The cousins were very good friends and, in fact, left Florence and uh, went to Rome together um, to become priests in Rome. And then later on, both of them uh, will be Pope. Uh, here it says, illegitimate son of um, Giuliano. Uh, the, uh, we, we saw him in... Um, in the portrait by Raphael, the portrait of Leo X. These are, they are the two cousins. And here is Giuliano as a cardinal standing next to his cousin. Uh, it is under Clement VII that the unthinkable will happen. Because of his various political machinations, uh, Charles V, who was uh, a holy Roman emperor in Germany, uh, decided to cross the Alps and uh, invade Italy. And in 1527, there will occur a most horrible sack of Rome. Nothing like this uh, had been seen in Rome since the days of the Goths. For months on end, uh, the troops of Charles V murdered, pillaged, burned, destroyed. Rome was never the same. And uh, there are a number of paintings, of course, that deal with it. Clement VII himself had to escape first to Castle St. Angelo and uh, then ultimately to Orvieto. And he will not return to Rome until about a year later. After the brutal execution of some 1,000 defenders of the papal capital and, uh, and the shrines, the pillage began. Churches and monasteries, as well as the palaces of prelates and cardinals, were looted and destroyed. And the Tiber was filled up with the bodies, and uh, the Tiber ran red. It was a horrendous occurrence. Um, Charles V troops consisted of uh, either the, uh, the German Landsknechts, who were uh, the most commonly used mercenaries at the time, or of uh, Spanish Catholics. And uh, neither the Germans nor the Spanish soldiers had um, any love for Rome and uh, were allowed to let rip. Uh, here is um, another painting uh, of, uh, of the same. Of course, uh, nuns were raped, uh, priests were murdered, uh, everything was burnt, uh, the looting was horrendous. It was essentially the end of uh, High Renaissance. The sack of Rome, 1527, marked the end of the Roman Renaissance and irreparably damaged the uh, papal prestige. Population of Rome dropped from some 55,000 before the attack to about 10,000. An estimated 2,000 people were murdered and an estimable number of people were uh, brutalized. One of the Swiss Guard's most notable hours occurred at this time. Almost the entire guard was massacred by the imperial troops on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica. Of 189 guards on duty, only the 42 who accompanied the Pope survived. But the bravery of the rear guard ensured that 
Pope Clement VII escaped to safety down the secret corridor which still links the Vatican City to Castle St. Angelo. And here are uh, the Swiss Guard. In, and in commemoration of the sack and the guard's bravery, recruits to the Swiss Guard are sworn in on 6th of May every year. Uh, the Swiss um, Guard was engaged officially by Julius II, by the Del Rovere Pope. But even before their official engagement, they often were engaged by, uh, by previous popes, uh, beginning with the Borgia Pope, beginning with Alexander VI, in fact. One of the uh, results of that sack was that um, Clement VII, hiding in Orvieto and essentially being entirely in, uh, in the power of uh, Charles V, could not give a marriage annulment to Henry VIII because Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon, who was the aunt of the emperor, the aunt of Charles V. And Charles V was not about to see Henry VIII divorce his aunt. And since the Pope was very much in his power, the Pope was powerless to give this annulment. And as a result of this, Henry VIII announced himself as head of, head of the Church and broke all ties with the Roman Catholic Church, thus inaugurating the, uh, the time of the dissolution of monasteries in England and, uh, and of course, introducing Episcopalianism. And all of that was because of the sack of Rome. And then, all, almost on his deathbed, Clement VII had an idea of um, painting the Last Judgment on the western wall of the Sistine Chapel and uh, taking up essentially the entire wall. Previously there was a Perugino uh, fresco there of uh, the uh, Ascension of the Virgin and then uh, and of course Michelangelo himself in the lunettes right there painted uh, part of the Sistine ceiling. But all of that now had to be uh, taken down and thus Michelangelo freed the entire wall for his um, last judgment. And in the arts Clement VII is remembered for having ordered just a few days before his death the, uh, the last judgment. And here we see it. Now this is a completely, it's a very, very different mood. Uh, it is, uh, it's almost, uh, it's 20 plus years now since he finished the, uh, uh, the ceiling of the chapel and uh, the whole mood had changed. Now previously, the last judgments, as you see here, here for instance is an example of a 12th century Byzantine mosaic of the Last Judgment. Everything was done in registers, everything was hierarchical, everybody belonged to its own register and of course hierarchical sizes were also observed. Uh, here's another one from the um, Florentine Baptistry. Here Christ sits uh, surrounded uh, by the holy persons and then on his right are the righteous that are ascending to heaven and on his left are the damned that, of course, are cast into hell. And you remember our last judgment of Giotto. Giotto, of course, by this time had the advantage of uh, his friendship with Dante, who pretty much uh, set out for him the uh, principle of retribution and thus classify the sins in their consecutive order. And as you remember, here is Christ again sitting in his mandorla and uh, here is hell from Christ's left side pours the uh, river of fire where there arrive the sinners. And one of the sinners is Judah that we talked about before and here he is right there. 
and uh, here is the principle of retribution where each sinner gets upon himself what he had inflicted upon others. Michelangelo, of course, goes his own way. There are no longer any registers. Everything is now united. In the middle sits, yeah, in the middle sits Christ. He no longer sits on the throne. The Madonna does not sit on the throne. Everybody floats. And, uh, in, and Christ himself is uh, presented as, uh, as this universal divine conductor. With his uh, right hand, he condemns the sinners, and with his left, he rises the, um, the righteous. So Michelangelo changes hands, because usually Christ, with his right hand, he rises uh, the righteous, and with the left hand, he condemns the sinners. So here things are reversed. But not only that, he sends the entire composition circling around clockwise, or we may even call it uh, a, wheel of, a, a wheel of fortune, and thus it goes around and around as the righteous rise and the damned fall. Unlike the high Renaissance compositions and unlike his own ceiling, he now chooses hierarchical um, size, and as such, the, the figures here are considerably larger than those at the bottom. Directly underneath Christ is a group in a circle, a group of angels, with, um, yeah, here, a group of angels who call out the judgment. And thus we have two of them. And the angels, Michelangelo's angels never have wings. He just felt it was, uh, it was interfering with the overall design. So one of them has a tiny, tiny little paperback. And from that tiny book, he calls out the names of the righteous to the right of Christ. And then, of course, the other one has an enormous volume that he can't even hold himself. He needs help to hold it because that's the book with all the sinners. Uh, Christ here is of a tremendous physique, although his face is very classical. And Michelangelo essentially took the face of um, Apollo Belvedere, which is um, supposedly a second uh, century copy of um, a fourth century BC uh, bronze original. And it was recovered in central Italy in the um, late 15th century. So everybody knew about it and it was considered one of the most beautiful statues that ever saw the light of day. Uh, and here is our circle. Uh, the um, hell, as you see here, hell is positioned directly over the uh, head of the celebrant or the head of the Pope. And then to the, uh, well, for us, to the left of hell, but to the right of Christ, are the righteous. And here we have it. Here is hell, and here are the righteous as on their way up into the blessed spheres. But uh, the demons are not just letting them go easily. And as you see, there, there's often the struggle between the angels and the demons, as you see here. Um, the uh, the uh, dead appear from under the earth as skeletons and then acquire flesh. And here is the mouth of hell, and that's where Michelangelo's imagination, of course, uh, uh, did its best in representing the demons. Here we are again, and uh, here are the righteous. And then on the other hand, so here is Christ with his apostles. Here are the righteous. Here are the sinners. The righteous and the sinners. The sinners now are all cast down into hell. And uh, here too, another famous detail of the fresco with a horrified sinner being pulled down by the demons. Now, we see a number of um, 
loincloths on the, on the bodies of the men, well, they were all nude because when Michelangelo first painted uh, the uh, Last Judgment, the majority of the figures were nude, but with the Counter-Reformation and its prudery that they had, in fact, to assume in order to combat Luther's Reformation, there were a number of complaints uh, against all the nudity in uh, the papal chapel and as a result one of the students, Daniela de Volterra, was asked to, uh, to paint these pieces of cloth and then even more was painted later on. Um, and then here you have uh, these bodies that arrive, that turn, that, uh, that fly, that uh, twist. Uh, you can see the, the artist's constant hunger for representing different positions. And while a number of uh, figures in the Last Judgment repeat uh, the positions of the system ceiling, the, uh, the forms, the twisted forms, uh, there are also, there's also a, a great deal of innovation, of course, that is allowed to Michelangelo by these extremes of salvation and condemnation. And here we see this part, this man who is being brought down by the demons. And then all of these, needless to say, are, they were all nude. This man is uh, covering his behind and uh, there's somebody's finger that's directed right inside it and here is the figure of Sharon as he is kicking the sinners out of his boat. Combines here uh, mythology and, uh, and Christianity for which of course he also was severely criticized. Here is Sharon's bark and here's Sharon himself and then on the side we see King Midas on a preview visit with Paul III before the work was complete, the Pope's master of ceremonies, whose name was uh, Viaggio da Sicena, is reported by Vasari as saying, it was most disgraceful that in so sacred a place there should have been depicted all those nude figures exposing themselves so shamefully and that it was no work for a papal chapel, but rather for the public baths and taverns. Vasari further reports that Michelangelo immediately worked Cesena's face into the scene as Minus, judge of the underworld with donkey ears indicating foolishness. What is also fascinating here is that uh, in addition to his ears, Michelangelo also gives him a snake that circles around his body and seems to be performing a fellatio on him. Now this is a very dis different task that the snake performs as opposed to the one that um, the snake performed in the ceiling where the snake was a she and played of course uh, a very important part in uh, the original sin. So Michelangelo sees uh, the snake's duties as um, multitasking. And uh, now look, all the bodies of the majority of the men are very significantly more muscular than the ones on the ceiling. And um, here is uh, our Christ, John the Baptist, right here, Saint Peter, St. Peter with the two keys, John the Baptist with his skin. Uh, and here is John the Baptist. And here is Parmesi Hercules. And uh, he too is a Hellenistic sculpture and presumably a 216 AD copy of uh, presumably again a bronze original by Lysippus, who was the sculptor of great athletic. Uh, heroic nudes back in the 4th century BC and this sculpture was in fact in um, the collection of the uh, Parmesi family and the next Pope will be Paul III, the, the Pope of the um, Counter-Reformation and the younger brother of Giulia Farnese 
who was the mistress of Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope. And when we look at the two, we can see that Michelangelo was very impressed by this as well. Uh, and here they are, Christ in the middle. Here's John the Baptist. Here is Peter. Saint Sebastian here with his arrows. Then Saint Lawrence with the gridon because his uh, martyrdom was that he was burnt alive on, uh, on a grill. And uh, we also see here Saint Bartholomew. Now, Saint Bartholomew's martyrdom was that he was um, flayed alive. And as such, you see him here with his own skin as he is looking over at, um, at Christ. <laughs> Interestingly, one of the loudest critics of Michelangelo at the time was one Pietro Aretino, who himself had composed uh, extremely lewd sonnets. But that was, of course, at the time when everything was allowed. Uh, the moment the Counter-Reformation happened, he turned around and began to criticize uh, Michelangelo. So Michelangelo paints his face into Saint Bartholomew, as you see here. Saint Bartholomew, here's his knife, here's his skin. Michelangelo also paints his own face on the skin here. Here it is. And there's the face of Michelangelo, and that's a drawing. The, the, of him. Saint Sebastian is uh, right here, as I said, with his arrows, because uh, his martyrdom was that, uh, that uh, he was um, pierced with arrows. And he too, in fact, he kind of looks like a, like a younger brother of Christ. Uh, it's the same classical face, the same very impressive physique. And uh, and here, what we have here is Saint Catherine of Alexandria and another uh, saint whose name is Saint Blaise. Now, this entire group was repainted because uh, presumably they were both nude, uh, Saint Catherine and Saint Blaise. And Saint Blaise, his uh, position was very different. He was directly over St. Catherine, and whatever the two of them were engaged in apparently did not please the later critics because uh, they were repainted. And here you can see the parts that were added and repainted all together, and among them is um, our, our couple. He... Um, he did, uh, towards the end of his life, <laughs> it seems that Michelangelo worked on a number of sculptures and uh, didn't, couldn't finish them, even though when he was uh, about 20 years old, he just uh, took their chisels and, and carved out this magnificent giant David in Florence and carved out the magnificent Pietà that is in, um, in the Vatican. But then towards the end of his life, he had difficulties finishing anything or being satisfied with his work. And here we have, uh, well, some call it a pieta, but then it also looks like a deposition, uh, or it could be a lamentation. And it is called the Florence Pieta, the Pieta del Domo, or the lamentation over that crest. Uh, so we really don't know, and we don't know what Michelangelo meant, or perhaps all together as one great sacrifice. Uh, what we see here is Christ in the center, of course, the, uh, uh, it almost as if he, he kind of returns to the high Renaissance triangle. And uh, we see it's either Joseph of Arimathea or uh, Nicodemus. And the Mary Magdalene, uh, considerably smaller again, on um, well, on the on our left or to the right of the group, and of course uh, a Virgin Mary. It's hard to tell. Uh, it seems that Michelangelo at one point attacked the uh, sculpture and attempted to destroy it. In fact, destroyed the le left leg of Christ. He is. Um, 
assistants uh, then uh, stopped him and uh, did as best they could in, in terms of putting it back together. But the left leg of Christ is still absent. It also possible uh, that uh, Michelangelo sculpted his own face into that of uh, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, the face the face is that of sorrow. Now it is good to remember that uh, that Christ was in fact after his death placed into the sarcophagus of Joseph of Arimathea and uh, and it is from that sarcophagus that he will later be resurrected. And when we look at the sculpture, it seems that Christ's body exercises this universal pull down to the unavoidable death here. And it, I mean, it's probably very fanciful, but uh, if Michelangelo identified himself with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, was it possible that uh, he also identified himself uh, with Christ and the approaching death because uh, uh, he was at this point uh, an older man and of course thinking of, uh, of the inevitable. Uh, but uh, the sculpture is not finished. Still another in an even less finished state uh, or rather in a totally unfinished state, is the so-called Rondanini Pietà, which lives in Milan, and the reason it's called the Rondanini Pietà is because it belonged to the family of the Rondanini for a long time. Uh, here, Michelangelo changed his mind uh, so many times. Uh, <laughs> it, it appears that he may have, in fact, created a whole thing at first, where Christ's right hand was here, then changed his mind and began to carve Christ out of the Virgin's right shoulder, then changed his mind again and began new carving, ultimately the elongated form of, the, um, of what we have now looks almost gothic and of course it also lo looks uh, very appealing to our eyes that are used to modern art, but that is his most unfinished pieta. There are also a number of unfinished slaves on which he worked his entire life, really. They were meant originally for the tomb of, uh, of Julius II, but since the tomb uh, never realized, Michelangelo was very frustrated about it and continued to work on some of these slaves uh, here. And they too are very appealing to us. Uh, with the art historian, it's, they, they find it hard to separate uh, Michelangelo's work from his neoplatonic uh, upbringing at the uh, court of, uh, of the Medici, of Lorenzo de' Medici, when he was uh, very, very young in Florence, and of course in, uh, in this interpretation, this all looks very much as the soul struggling to free itself from, uh, from the corrupted body. And uh, here is uh, one of them, and it seems that his uh, right leg corresponds to the right arm and uh, there is the left arm that is um, just indicated and uh, the face as well, literally just the beard we see. And this is a cross-legged uh, slave. Here is uh, still another who is struggling to come out of the uh, rock. It appears that Michelangelo's assistants may have worked on the legs uh, later on which is why a number of people find the legs awkward. And still another where the face is not even carved out of the block. It is quite clear that in all of them the most important, the first thing that Michelangelo worked on was the torso. And often Michelangelo worked, uh, as an Egyptian sculptor would, uh, from four sides. Uh, now here 
he clearly worked from three sides, but uh, probably not the fourth. Here they are, the unfinished slaves. They are in uh, Florence. And um, uh, this is a picture of this horrible flood that uh, happened in Florence in the year 1966 when young people from, from, uh, from all over the world, in fact, uh, came to Florence to try and, uh, and save the works of art. Last but not least, uh, I want to mention that um, the very last of the Medici was Anna Maria Luisa de Medici, who died in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, she was, um, she is holding here a miniature of her husband, who was an elector palatine, one of the electors of the Holy Roman Emperor. She was a patron of the arts and she bequeathed the Medici's large art collection, and that included the contents of the Uffizi Palazzo Pitti and the Medician Villas, which she inherited upon her brother John Gastoni's death in 1737 and her Palatine treasures. She bequeathed it all to the Tuscan state on the condition that no part of it could be removed from the capital of the Grand Ducal State and from the succession of his serene Grand Duke, which is the reason why when Napoleon invaded Italy and, uh, and uh, took so much treasure out of Italy back to Paris, however, he could not loot Florence because of this donation. And, and as such, all the treasures of Florence remain intact. A lot of the loot France had to return later, uh, which is interesting because uh, all the loot that the Austrians uh, took earlier uh, is, of course, still in Austria, and they were not obliged to return that. But neither the Austrians nor the French could touch the Florentine treasures because of uh, Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici. And um, thus we've come to the end of our lecture today, and um, we shall uh, travel to Venice uh, next time for our last lecture of the series. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.